For decades, young female actresses have been the stars of horror films spanning across several subgenres from paranormal to slasher. Actresses known for their horror roles have come to be known as Scream Queens. The way these Scream Queens characters have been portrayed in film often provides a dramatized reflection of how both womanhood and femininity are viewed by large parts of society. Throughout the evolution of film as an industry and horror as a genre, the types of characters Scream Queens play too have evolved. Many of the depictions of females in horror movies were originally rooted in the damsel in distress trope that's been popular in film, books, and other media for centuries. These young women were often portrayed as helpless and panicky, typically only defending themselves and displaying agency quite literally only when their lives depended on it. In all other situations, the character is often submissive and quiet. And let's not forget, she's young and beautiful too and reflects society's beauty standards of the time. This type of portrayal of women in horror can be traced all the way back to the silent film era. An example is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, released in 1920. The German expressionist film depicts a hypnotist who uses his sleepwalking victims to commit murders. The film is considered one of the best German films and films in general from the silent era. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari inspired Hollywood horror films of the 20s and 30s, as well as film noir in the following decades and is still used as an exemplar in many film studies classes. One of the characters in the film, Jane, is the victim of both Dr. Caligari as well as a man named Cesare who's been entranced by Dr. Caligari and now wants her to be his next victim. She's pursued and kidnapped, and eventually Cesare intends to stab her in her sleep. However, because of her beauty, he finds himself unable to commit the act and instead abducts her. Though Jane's actress, Lil Dagover, wasn't considered a scream queen, we can still see some of the seeds being planted. A young, beautiful actress plays a character equally young and equally beautiful, pursued and tortured at the hands of a man or creature who's meant to do her harm. In some way or another, her youth, beauty, and femininity are addressed, and in this case, are life-saving. The earliest instance of an actress being directly referred to as a Scream Queen was when the press anointed Faye Ray as a Scream Queen for her work in King Kong and her less-remembered roles in two other horror films prior. Ray played Anne Darrow in the 1933 film. Though King Kong isn't a horror film, Ray's character still fits many of the same characteristics of those played by Scream Queens. In King Kong, Ray plays a young, beautiful woman being held against her will by a violent and human creature. Ray became famous for her screams and was eventually unfortunately typecast, which she wasn't happy with. Ray admitted that she never liked being called a Scream Queen and it hindered her chance of branching out into other roles. Though she acted for decades after King Kong and turned down a role in the 2004 remake, it was still the role that she was forever most remembered for. I feel like part of the reason for the typecasting of earlier Scream Queens can be attributed to the fact that their characters are very flat. Plainly put, their characters were just known for screaming or being attacked, but their characters received little screen time or development outside of their suffering being made into spectacle. This, of course, is limiting for any actress, and making the most out of the limited material given inadvertently sends the message that this is the only type of role in which they would excel. In the 1960s, Psycho's Marion Crane, played by Janet Lee, both popularized and cemented the Scream Queen in cinema. This is so much so that many consider Lee, rather than Faye Ray, to be the original Scream Queen. Those who do have a fair point, as Psycho actually is a horror film adapted from a novel of the same name. Psycho focuses on the aftermath of an unfortunate encounter between Marion Crane, a thief on the loose, and a motel owner named Norman Bates. Though Marion is offed by the half-hour mark of the film, Lee still manages to make an unforgettable impression with the role. Psycho's shower scene is one of the most memorable moments in horror cinema, and the image itself of Lee screaming in the shower is just as iconic. The shower scene in Psycho is a masterclass in creating suspense and discomfort, and Lee's performance has become like a playbook for future Scream Queens. It's also not lost that being in the shower is typically a moment where someone is at their most vulnerable and helpless, which is how we're meant to view Marion in this moment and Scream Queens of this era in general. Like Faye Ray, Lee was praised for her blood-curdling screams, which are extremely difficult for a person to capture when they're just acting. Lee was nominated for an Academy Award for her performance, but unfortunately didn't win. Though reception of Psycho was mixed when the film was released, it's now considered one of Hitchcock's best films and one of the earliest slasher films. Slasher films eventually become the horror subgenre most known for producing Scream Queens, but that doesn't really become so until the late 70s and early 80s. In 1973, Linda Blair took on the star-making role as Reagan McNeil in The Exorcist. The Exorcist 2 is a book adaptation in which a young girl is possessed by a demon and her mother seeks out a priest to save her via exorcism. 
Blair was only 14 when The Exorcist was released, meaning she was likely only 12 or 13 during filming. Despite her young age, her performance as Reagan blew audiences away and it won her a Golden Globe. Fun fact, Janet Lee's daughter, Jamie Lee Curtis, was asked to audition for the role of Reagan, but Lee declined on her behalf. Though Blair's performance earned her acclaim, it was arguably hardly worth the trauma she endured on set. Sometimes it's easy to forget that though the events in movies are fictional, there's psychologically little difference between acting out a traumatic experience and actually enduring it. During filming, Blair was strapped to a rigged bed during one of the possession scenes, and she actually fractured her spine. To make things worse, that take made it into the final cut of the film, and some of the screens heard are genuine screams of pain rather than Blair acting. She also revealed that the glue used to apply her prosthetic makeup left burns on her face. Other actors on set were also harassed, and the poor set conditions were intended to create an atmosphere of genuine anxiety. Even after The Exorcist's release, many disgruntled with the film's subject matter, especially its portrayal of Catholicism, sent 14-year-old Linda Blair death threats. The Exorcist was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, and it was the first horror film to be nominated for Best Picture. To date, it's one of the most popular horror films of all time, and is both a horror and pop culture staple. The success of The Exorcist further helped the horror genre go mainstream and ensure that we would see young women suffering on the big screen for decades to come. Surprisingly, Blair reprised the role of Reagan in 1977's The Exorcist II. Unlike the original Exorcist film, this one was very poorly received. Mark Kermode, a film critic for the BBC, said, Exorcist II is demonstrably one of the worst films ever made. It took the greatest film ever made and trashed it in a way that was on one level farcically stupid and on another level absolutely unforgivable. Everyone involved in this, apart from Linda Blair, should be ashamed for all eternity. Because of Blair's part in the Exorcist film, she was typecast and expressed having trouble finding roles outside of horror or roles where she wasn't playing a victim. Blair eventually focused on smaller roles in film and TV and became an animal rights activist. In 2021, she announced she wasn't offered a role in the Exorcist reboot. Though a lot of fans were upset by this, I don't think this has the same energy as Jamie Lee Curtis or the Scream cast reprising their roles because this was obviously a traumatic experience for Blair. Though she wasn't asked, it was probably unlikely that she had returned to the films anyway. In the late 1970s, a more modern take on the Scream Queen emerged. There's a notable shift from their characters solely being damsels in distress to them being heroines who triumph in the end. Thanks to the aforementioned Psycho and the subsequent rise of slasher films, the portrayal of the young women in these films shifts too. She becomes a young woman whose mission is to evade being brutally attacked, often a series of killings to which she is both a witness and a target. Yet she has more wit and agency than her predecessors, and her character is often, but not always, more fleshed out. In 1978, Jamie Lee Curtis made her horror debut as Laurie Strode in the film Halloween. She wasn't initially chosen to play Laurie, but was offered the role as an homage to the genre due to her mother's legendary performance in Psycho. To quickly summarize the plot, Michael Myers is an escapee from a mental hospital who killed his sister 15 years ago on Halloween night and plans to do so again. Lori becomes the target as she lives in Michael's childhood home where the atrocities took place. Though Lori is pursued relentlessly by Michael Myers throughout the film, she ultimately defeats him and survives, and is the lone teenage survivor of Michael's spree. Though Lori doesn't deliver the final blows, a male character does, Lori is still shown to have a lot of fight in her and faces off with Michael several times in the film. The ending of the film reveals, however, that Michael wasn't in fact defeated, much to Lori's horror. Curtis's role as Laurie solidified her as a scream queen, and she went on to not only play in other horror films like Prom Night, but also reprised the role of Laurie in seven other Halloween films, including an extended cut of their original film. Though Jamie Lee Curtis was afraid of being typecast like many past scream queens, this of course didn't happen. She went on to establish herself as a respected dramatic actress, as well as a comedic one. Most people my age probably know her as the mom from Freaky Friday or the Activia Lady, rather than from her original horror films. Jamie Lee's role as Laurie Strode eventually gained her the title of Original Final Girl, a trope that simultaneously applied to many Scream Queens and teen slasher films. So from here on out in the video, many of the Scream Queens that I do discuss will also fit the Final Girl trope. I do want to quickly distinguish, though, that typically the title of Scream Queen refers to the actress, and the title of Final Girl usually refers to the character in the film. So for example, Jamie Lee Curtis is a Scream Queen, but her character Laurie Strode is a Final Girl. The Final Girl is a character in the slasher film who, as the title suggests, is the last main character standing at the end of the film. She's typically witnessed the death of friends and family at the hands of someone who too is pursuing her. 
The final girl typically is the character who discovers the killer's motives and identity and recounts the story to authorities. The term was officially coined in 1992, but has retroactively been applied to characters who fit the bill like Laurie Strode, Ripley from Alien, and Nancy from A Nightmare on Elm Street. The originator of the term, Carol J. Clover, adds that there's typically an implication of moral superiority with the final girl. She's usually the nice girl next door and is typically a saint compared to her peers who engage in delinquent behaviors. The final girl is feminine, but not too feminine. Hyperfemininity is often reserved either for side characters or antagonists in slasher films, and these characters are implied to have deserved their deaths because of their meanness, stupidity, or promiscuity. The final girl, however, is not like other girls, and because of how she presents herself, we're meant to think that she contains a certain substance that her other female peers inherently lack. Clover herself says that characters like Mary and Crane are not final girls. One, she doesn't make it to the end of the film. Two, because she's on the run from a crime she committed, that means she lacks the moral fiber that the final girl typically possesses. In addition, not every girl who survives at the end of a horror movie is a final girl, just as not every actress who's been in a horror movie is considered a scream queen. In the 1980s and 90s, the type of final girl shown on screen shifts a little. The final girl is allowed to be flawed like a normal human being and less of a quote-unquote prude. The final girl often has a boyfriend or romantic partner, but make no mistake, that's typically the only one she'll get for the film. Though she may be in a relationship, we almost never see the final girl seal the deal with her boyfriend. This is in contrast to the death by sex trope, in which characters die directly after having sex, which in some ways frames the act as immoral and implies their death is justified. This is also because the final girl's relationship is usually shown as deeper and as if she has not just a physical connection with her romantic interest, but an emotional one too. In the 1981 film Friday the 13th, protagonist Alice Hardy is the only counselor to survive the serial murders at Camp Crystal Lake. Alice is a student and aspiring artist who works at the camp with her teenage peers. Though Alice drinks and smokes, we're still meant to understand that she's more traditional than the other counselors and probably wouldn't have engaged in such behaviors without them. In addition, her almost relationship with her boss at the camp isn't framed in a way that villainizes Alice, but shows that she's special in some way and is meant to be respected. Alice is the one to uncover the identity of the masked assailant, revealing her to be Jason Voorhees' mother. She defeats her in a final face-off at the end of the film and is then rescued by emergency services. Jason, however, is still on the loose. The following year, Friday the 13th Part 2 was released. Alice is killed by Jason very early into the film. This plays on another trope where the final girl in one movie is off very early into the sequel. Alice's death creates space for our new protagonist, Jenny Field, to be Jason's next victim. At several points, Jenny and her boyfriend, Paul, evade Jason and his attacks. At the end of the film, Jenny attempts to outwit Jason using his dead mother. After another attack that leaves Paul dead, Jenny is found, rescued, and treated. In 1984, A Nightmare on Elm Street was released, giving birth to classic horror villain Freddy Krueger. Krueger uniquely did away with his teenage victims in their dreams, which ended their lives in the real world also. As Kruger picks off Nancy's friends, she races against time and sleep itself to figure out why she and her friends have been targeted by Kruger. Nancy eventually uncovers the secret, one which her parents and other adults in the town have kept for years. In a very meta final face-off, Nancy lures Kruger out of the dream world and subdues him with several booby traps so that she can defeat him and then run for help. However, Nancy's triumph is short-lived as it's heavily implied that her victory over Kruger was only temporary. The 1970s and 80s established a typical formula for several genres of horror films, be it a family afflicted by demonic presence a la The Exorcist, or slasher films like Halloween, Friday the 13th, and A Nightmare on Elm Street. By the 1990s, slasher films had drastically decreased in popularity. The most popular slashers to come out of the 1990s are undoubtedly the Scream films. The Scream franchise is interesting in that while it relies on a lot of common horror tropes to move the plot, the film also shows an in-universe awareness of these tropes. Scream, released in 1996, was directed by Wes Craven, who also directed A Nightmare on Elm Street. With the film, Craven intended to subvert typical horror cliches, yet still rely on tropes in order to create a modern slasher. The film makes references to past horror movies like Halloween, When a Stranger Calls, and Craven's own A Nightmare on Elm Street. The first subversion in the film comes at the very beginning when we're introduced to Casey, played by Drew Barrymore. She's blonde, she's sweet, and most importantly, she's home alone. 
As Casey talks on the phone with Ghostface, we're still of the opinion that she's likely our final girl and that surely she'll escape from Ghostface. Yet she's killed minutes into the film, revealing her death is just the opening sequence and that this won't at all be a traditional horror movie. In Scream, residents of the fictional town of Woodsboro are terrorized by a masked assailant known as Ghostface. The attacks begin on the anniversary of the brutal death of the mother of the protagonist, Sydney Prescott. Sydney and her high school friends not only try to escape Ghostface, but also try to get inside of his head to discover his identity. The characters in the film, primarily Randy, Billy, and Stu, make several references to horror tropes and cliches, using them as a guideline to determine who Ghostface might be and how to anticipate his next moves. At the climax of the film, we find out that Billy and Stu's knowledge isn't purely coincidental, but that they've used it to essentially create their own slasher. Billy and Sydney do actually sleep together in the film, which is something that a final girl of decades past would have never been allowed to do. Sydney isn't punished for this act, as she escapes Ghostface attack directly after. In this way, Scream subverts the death by sex trope, as well as the idea that the final girl must be a virgin. Scream follows the precedent set by Nightmare on Elm Street that the final girl has some sort of personal connection with the killer. Scream's success and its sequels are credited with reviving slasher films in the 1990s. For decades, Scream held the title of the highest grossing slasher film until the Halloween reboot was released in 2018. Sydney Prescott is often given the credit for not only being one of the best final girls, but also redefining the concept of a final girl. Like other final girls before her, Sydney's intelligence and awareness of her surroundings ensures that she outlasts Ghostface other victims. Her appearance in the second film and survival throughout it also subverts the trope I mentioned earlier, where the OG final girl doesn't make it through the sequel. Sydney's trauma from her experiences isn't brushed off, and we see her work through it in the following films of the franchise. She grows from her experiences and uses them to confront several iterations of Ghostface. Sydney isn't one to run unless it's the only option, and she doesn't let innocence die at her expense whenever she can help it. Sydney also does something that many other final girls don't. She makes sure whatever version of Ghostface she's facing is actually dead. Sydney's role in the Scream franchise is expanded far beyond a young girl who's a victim. She leaves no room for her to be taken as a damsel in distress, and over the course of the films becomes somewhat of a veteran and a mentor. Nev Campbell has played Sydney Prescott in five Scream films, which helped her earn the title as one of the 90s and 2000s most prominent Scream queens. She's also known for her role in The Craft, which was released shortly before Scream. Sadly, Nev announced she won't be starring in the sixth Scream movie coming out next year, but Sydney's character has had a legendary run regardless. Other Scream queens of the era included Sarah Michelle Gellar, known for her roles in I Know What You Did Last Summer, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, The Grudge, and a small role in Scream 2. Jennifer Love Hewitt had a short-lived stint as a Scream Queen while starring alongside Geller in I Know What You Did Last Summer, as well as its sequel, I Still Know What You Did Last Summer. The later 2000s and 2010s are a weird time for Scream Queens. I think it's because during this time, a good portion of the horror films coming out were either remakes or sequels that relied on the popularity of their original films in the franchise. This was especially true for slasher films, with franchises like A Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and Texas Chainsaw all getting remakes and prequels, and sequels, most of which were panned. Because of this shift in the types of horror films that were popular, we also see a shift away from many horror films having final girls, as a lot of them aren't slasher films. Rather than slashers, movies centering around ghosts, demonic possessions, and haunted houses rose in popularity. One of the most popular films from this era was The Conjuring. The 2013 film followed a family suffering with demonic possession in their home. The family employs the services of married demonologist Ed and Lorraine Warren, the latter being played by Vera Farmiga. Farmiga played Lorraine Warren in several films in the Conjuring universe, including two other Conjuring films, The Nun and Annabelle Comes Home. Vera Farmiga has been held as a scream queen for over a decade, starting back with her role in 2009's Orphan. Farmiga has also played Norma Bates in Bates Motel, a prequel series adapted from Psycho. I think the most noticeable thing about Farmiga being a Scream Queen is that she isn't a teenager, nor is she in her early 20s. Because of this, Farmiga's characters often possesses more experience and pragmatism, yet this makes instances where she's truly terrified all the more chilling. I can't talk about 2010 Scream Queens without mentioning Sarah Paulson, of course. There's a reason several of her screams are viral, and she's both a well-respected Hollywood actress and an internet favorite. Ah! He's escaping! As far as horror, Paulson is most known for her roles in several volumes of American Horror Story, as well as Ratchet, another Ryan Murphy production. 
Paulson is able to transform and deliver performances that are unsettling and creepy, and I personally feel like she's an actress who can emote genuine fear better than a lot of actresses working today. Yes, sometimes her expressions and screams are funny, but part of leaning into a horror role is not being afraid of looking silly, as you really wouldn't be if you were actually in the moment. Despite Farmiga and Paulson redefining the typical scream queen, the majority of the current generation's scream queens are still young women. This actually includes Vera Farmiga's younger sister, Thaisa Farmiga, who a lot of you probably recognize from also being in several volumes of American Horror Story. Chloe Grace Moretz has been working in the horror genre since childhood, acting in 2005's Amityville Horror at age 8. Her most prominent horror role is probably in 2013's Carrie remake. She has several horror films under her belt, many of which she starred in. I think one of the most underrated upcoming screen queens is Maka Monroe. She's most known for her role in It Follows, in which she's also the final girl. It's a more modern take on horror and the final girl concept, as the so-called villain of the movie is a curse that follows teens after they sleep with someone, lest they pass the curse off to someone else. Monroe also had a role in Greta alongside Chloe Grace Moretz and most recently starred in the psychological thriller Watcher. Monroe herself has said that she's felt a shift in the horror genre with the presence of films like The Witch and The Babadook, which thrive off of creating an atmosphere of anxiety and restlessness throughout the film, and through those feelings comes the fear. In a lot of modern horror films, we're not scared by what we see, but the work our brain does filling in the gaps of things that we don't see or understand. Anya Taylor-Joy is also considered one of the current generation's scream queens, thanks to her roles in movies like The Witch, The Northman, and Split. Anya made her debut in 2015 in Robert Eggers' The Witch, in which she played Thomason, the eldest daughter in an exiled Puritan family. The family experiences many paranormal events, which lead the family to accuse Thomason of being a witch. At the end of the film, after her entire family perishes, Thomason joins a coven of witches and is implied to belong with them more than she ever did in her family. In a sense, Thomason is a final girl, or might I say an anti-final girl. It's not her piety and purity that protects her, but her honesty, her realism, and in a sense, her selfishness. She's offered a liberation after a life of practicing repression and abstinence, traits that almost all final girls possessed. Thomason openly embraces her womanhood, shedding any shame of it that's been ingrained in her, which grants her eternal life and power. In Split, Anya's character Casey is kidnapped with two of her friends by a man struggling with DID. In the end, Casey escapes, not because she outwits one of the altars, but because it recognizes that she too has experienced trauma in her past. Again, it's repression and silent, quiet suffering that makes one of Taylor Joy's characters special and saves her from the fate of others close to her. She also landed a role in the film sequel, Glass. In 2022, Anya also starred in Last Night in Soho, in which an aspiring fashion designer is able to somewhat time travel back to the 60s, seemingly through her dreams. Anya played an aspiring singer in 1960s London who was taken advantage of by a man in the industry and thought by the protagonist who have been killed by him. In a twist, it's revealed that Anya's character never died and that she in fact killed the man and now owns the rental in which the main character stays. I think what makes Anya's roles interesting is that they portray horror and suffering in a way that's more nuanced and psychological in addition to just physical suffering. In most of her roles, her character's suffering comes at the hands of her place in the society she lives in. Her character's power typically comes from confrontation and acceptance and a growing self-confidence. Anya's roles often also embrace womanhood and femininity and give value to it. I think a lot of Anya's roles fit into what I've seen called the good for her genre of films, in which a woman triumphs over some sort of oppressive circumstance, usually in a family or a relationship. Other films considered part of this pseudo-genre like Gone Girl, Mother, and Midsummer, also contain horror elements or just are horror films themselves. I don't think this is by accident because a lot of horror films center around female suffering. This is a great place to talk about Carrie, the 1976 version of course. Carrie White is bullied at school and prevented from being a normal teenager by her religious fanatic mother. Carrie eventually discovers that she has telekinetic powers, which she uses to take revenge on her bullies and her mother. Similar to a lot of Anya's films, it seems that the true villains in Carrie are isolation and repression of her true self, of her desires, and of her womanhood. The film seems to imply that the consequences of growing up as a repressed young woman are catastrophic. But it's interesting to see that horror films nearly 50 years later have come back around to exploring these similar themes. 
I'm not at all of the opinion that movies are required to make any sort of social commentary, but in a sense, these sorts of horror films are scarier in that though most of us haven't encountered a mass killer chasing us down, we've battled with shame, repression, and isolation to degrees that can feel impossible to cope with. This is emphasized by the fact that Carrie dies in the end, or more accurately phrased, implodes. But more modern movies that explore similar themes like The Witch and Midsummer not only have the main character triumph, but fully lean into the destruction that they've caused and draw power and independence from it that they haven't previously experienced. I'm sure it's obvious that all of the Scream Queens and Final Girls I've talked about up to this point are white women. Aside from the lack of diversity in film and television generally, the characters played by Scream Queens are meant to be seen as vulnerable, yet morally superior and worth saving. In addition, the idea has persisted that white women are the only type of woman who can most believably and most easily be viewed as a victim. Usually, the ability to see someone as a victim stems from the ability to have empathy for them and see them and their experiences as valid. For a while, the type of women thought to fit this idea was narrow, and that translated to little representation of women of color in the horror genre, much less as a protagonist or final girl. The only example that goes against this that I can think of that somewhat made waves was Lupita Nyong'o's role as Miss Caroline in Little Monsters. Miss Caroline is both the heroine and the love interest of one of the main characters who falls in love with her not only because of her beauty, but also her bravery and protectiveness. As far as horror goes though, Lupita's probably most known for her roles in Jordan Peele's Us. Peele, of course, is known for casting primarily black actors in his horror films, and because of this, the entire main cast of Us was black. Lupita delivers such a nuanced performance and in two different roles that you almost forget that you're watching one actress play two different characters. Lupita carried both of these films, and I hope that she does more horror roles in the future. She's not someone I would have initially pegged as a potential scream queen earlier on in her career, but I think that she would make a good one, and she's clearly demonstrated that she does have the range. Horror movies have started to include characters of color more than in the past decades, but these characters still often aren't main characters, nor do they make it to the end of the film. The lack of diversity has been critiqued by many watchers of horror films, as well as content meant to satirize them. As elements of a genre or trope become more concrete and recognizable by audiences, and the more discussion there is around them, it creates space for satire and subversion of these tropes or pitfalls. One of the best examples of horror satire is the show Scream Queens. The 2015 show was also produced by Ryan Murphy. The title itself could not be more on the nose. Scream Queens is framed within the very white world of Greek life at fictional Wallace University. A freshman student named Grace joins the Kappa Kappa Tau sorority in order to uncover more about her dead mother's mysterious past. The sorority is dominated by mean girls called the Chanel's, the leader of which is Emma Roberts as Chanel Oberlin. Honestly, Emma should have won an Emmy for this role. She's hilariously hateable, and her one-liners are so funny that sometimes you find yourself rooting for her even though you know you're supposed to hate her. Chanel and her sorority sisters balk at being forced to diversify their sorority, and this very act is framed as a punishment. If Dean Munch gets her way, Kappa's gonna be filled with fatties and ethnics. The fatties will bring their big ol' appetites, and you know what those ethnics will bring with them? Weird spices from their home countries. The girls of Kappa Kappa Tau are hunted down by the Red Devil, whose identity Grace and her friends race against time to uncover. Grace also tries to uncover her connection to the Red Devil in a fashion that's reminiscent of past final girls like Nancy Thompson and Sidney Prescott. Grace is overly plucky in a way that often comes off as cringy, self-righteous, and downright annoying. And unlike many other final girls, we see characters other than the killer view her from a negative perspective and openly dislike her. One of the biggest nods to the horror genre and scream queens of past is Jamie Lee Curtis's inclusion as Dean Munch. Dean Munch is an adversary to Chanel and is the one who forces the Kappa Kappa Tau sorority to accept all of their pledges. Though they are included, however, it still isn't lost that none of them are the show's protagonist. The closest we get is Kiki Palmer in the role of Zayday Williams. Scream Queens has the cliche can't be toned perfect for a teen slasher, yet with the self-awareness to not take seriously things that have now become evident audiences also won't take seriously. Scream Queens lived and died by its satirical nature. When it was good, it was great, but when it was bad, it was too over the top and some scenes were just clearly contrived and nearly unwatchable. Another great example of a comedic take on horror is The Cabin in the Woods. The film focuses on a group of college friends spending the weekend at a remote cabin in the forest. Scientists engineer their friends' experiences, from deciding what monsters will attack them to manipulating them with pheromones. 
One of the characters applies horror tropes to their situation in a way similar to Scream and applies names to his friends to indicate the tropes and archetypes that they represent. And at the end of the film, we're left with Dana, our final girl, who of course is nicknamed the Virgin. It is revealed that Dana's lone survival was the desired outcome, so much so that the engineers are upset when they find out that one of Dana's male friends is also still alive. It's revealed that their weekend stay was engineered in order to fulfill a sacrificial ritual meant to satisfy ancient deities. The American version of the ritual requires the sacrifice of five teen slasher archetypes, others being the whore, the fool, and the athlete. It's an intelligent and funny piece of film that both relies on horror tropes, but at the same time comments on how engineered and manufactured the slasher genre has become. An actress that I'm really excited to hopefully see come into her own as a scream queen is Jenna Ortega. She's probably most known for her role as Ellie in horror drama You. She's also been in several other horror films, including Insidious Chapter 2, The Babysitter Killer Queen, Scream 5, Studio 666, and X. Ortega will also be starring as Wednesday Adams in Tim Burton's Netflix series Wednesday. Notably, Jenna was the final girl in Scream 5, teaming up with the franchise's OG final girl Sydney Prescott to defeat Ghostface in the end. In the opening sequence, Ortega's character plays homage to Drew Barrymore's cameo over 20 years prior. Jenna's role in X is anticipated to take her to an echelon of horror films similar to that of Anya Taylor-Joy, which are typically considered more cinematic, artsy, and experimental than traditional slasher films. Ortega played Lorraine, who we initially believe will be the pure, prudent final girl type, but were quickly shown otherwise. Even before the film's release, Ortega was praised for her acting in the trailer, namely her screams. Despite already having the title of Scream Queen bestowed upon her due to her impressive resume, Ortega still feels like she has some growing to do before accepting the title. She says, It feels wrong to even take that title because I think I have a few more projects to go. I need a good cult classic or something. It's been interesting because I haven't always been the final girl. Sometimes I die, sometimes I live, you're just gonna have to wait and see. And waiting eagerly we will be. Jenna Ortega is a breath of fresh air in the acting world, not only because of the impressive performances she's delivered as a teenager, but because she also inspires hope for more diversity in the Scream Queens that we'll see in the future. Mia Goth is another actress that will undoubtedly continue to have a promising career in the horror genre. She starred alongside Jenna Ortega in X, in which she played both the protagonist and the villain. Currently, Mia is receiving rave reviews for her performance in a psychological slasher prequel, Pearl. It's heavily implied that Pearl's upbringing, as well as her feelings of insecurity and exclusion, have led her to commit heinous acts. Goth's performance has been called brilliant and grandiose, and has been likened to that of Shelley Duvall. A review for The Guardian said about Pearl, Perhaps I shouldn't have enjoyed Pearl as much as I did, but it's clever, limber, gruesome, and brutally well acted, a gem. Goth's performances in Pearl and X have solidified her as another one of this generation's scream queens. Mia has also been praised for performances in horror films earlier in her career like A Cure for Wellness and Suspiria. Goth's Scream Queen is similar to some of those other good for her films that I mentioned in that she's usually the source of her own salvation, but the salvation frequently toes the line or blatantly crosses over into villainy. Many modern Scream Queen's characters do a complete 180 from victim to villain, which seems to represent them growing into their autonomy and control. It'll be interesting to see how these characters evolve and how it seems like we'll get to see more of them continue to take control of their narratives, whatever that looks like. In horror films, there's almost always been a sort of juxtaposition between feminine beauty and innocence and death, destruction, and gore. These characters are made the symbol of a power imbalance in which women are often subjected to acts of violence and trauma, which we see fictionalized and dramatized on screen. It's not lost that the villain in horror films is almost always male or presumed to be. This is especially the case in slasher films. Even in cases where the killer is in fact a woman, like Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, or the Red Devil, they're still presumed male for the majority of the plot. This means that for the majority of the film, we're seeing a female character being pursued and victimized by a male figure, even if this isn't technically the case. Though this is not all true, being victimized and preyed on is often considered feminine. Though we typically see the Scream Queen or a Final Girl triumph, a good portion of the movie is spent seeing her suffer and display fear and terror. These emotions typically aren't considered masculine. In addition, like I said earlier, men historically aren't objectified the way that women are either. This isn't to say that any role a Scream Queen takes on is completely sexist in nature. 
Often we see these women overcome traumatic experiences and grow from them, especially in more recent portrayals of women in the horror genre. Over the past decades, horror films have provided a lot of female characters whose suffering we can relate to, and seeing a woman fight back and even succeed at times can be inspirational. A positive that I've noticed is that it seems like many later Scream Queens of the 80s and beyond have been able to carry that title yet avoid being typecast. Actresses like Jamie Lee Curtis, Nev Campbell, Anya Taylor-Joy, and Jenna Ortega have all had several roles outside of the horror genre. I think this is because their characters have been increasingly shown as humans rather than a mannequin with long hair whose only job it is is to scream and be slaughtered. This of course allows for the actresses in those roles to showcase their range and show off how well they can play a character as opposed to simply showing how well they can scream. I think giving these women roles to play that are substantial and nuanced is why so many of them, like Nev, Jamie, and Mia, have chosen to reprise their roles several times. Mia will be returning to Maxine, the final film in the X trilogy next year. Jamie Lee Curtis is returning again as Laurie Strode for a final time in Halloween Ends, though she said that before, so we'll see if this really is the last time. This video essay by no means is meant to be an exhaustive list of every horror movie, every scream queen, and every final girl. However, I did try my best to choose examples that help illustrate the points made in the video. Please feel free to mention or discuss any other horror movies you think fit in the comments, because there really are so many more to talk about that I just didn't have time to discuss. Horror is a genre that I truly enjoy watching, so I really enjoy doing this video and talking about it, and I've seen all of these movies, so it's kind of fun to talk about them with you guys. I hope you guys enjoy horror too, or at least enjoyed the video, and you know I had to give you guys something for spooky season. But anyways, thank you guys so much for watching and bearing with me, and I'll see you guys soon. And as you enjoy your spooky season festivities, be sure to be safe, be vigilant, because weirdos don't just exist in movies, but in real life too. Love you goblins and ghouls, Bye bye